So welcome to our panel discussion on building resilience and mental health and performing arts. So this was originally meant to be part of the Move It 2020 seminar series, but of course that was stopped due to COVID-19, making sure that the participants, attendees and exhibitors are safe. Um, so what we decided to do is uh, we just decided to do it here instead. Um, why not? So what, I, what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to go around everyone, just going to introduce themselves. So I'll start with myself, uh, then I'll move on to Nicola, and then uh, Gloria, and then finish with Toby. Um, so those of you who don't know who are watching, my name is Josh Armstrong. I am the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of King Alpha Theatre Arts Community Interest Company, Cato Academy and Cato Clothing. I've just finished my undergraduate degree in Theatre Production, Arts and Stage Management before I move on to a... MSc in international business. Um, I've, I've trained mostly in dance through my life and then I moved into backstage work when I went to Catholic College and since then I've been doing a lot of producing of shows <laughs> since then. Uh, so moving on to Nicolette. Hello everyone, hi, nice to be here. Thank you for organising this Josh and for bringing us all together. Um, I'm Nicolette Wilson Clark, and I have a business called The Creative Genius, which is an organization, a creative organization, coaching and consultancy that serves the professional creative in understanding and managing their emotions to get through every day, really, <laughs> and to stay strong with grace and courage, <laughs> not to fall apart. Um, that's what I do. Uh, background uh, started years ago in advertising, um, did a degree in health studies and then came out of advertising and went into music production, which I loved. Um, decided that actually my passion was definitely in health. So did all of the journeys to go into, back into the health, wellness and fitness industry and uh, taught just about everything apart from step. Then went into uh, personal training and went into management of health clubs as well. Um, and then I got the opportunity to be invited to set up a gym in a, a really well-established, well-known London performing arts school. And so I left to go and do that and was there for a good few years. But at that point, I realized that I really want to work with this group of people and I want more. So I literally jacked it in reluctantly, but enthusiastically to go and um, train to, to become a dancer. And I did dance training for four years, starting at Morley College, finishing at Laban and um, loved every single second of it. And then from there, I developed my other qualifications of yoga and Pilates and set up a yoga business, set up a yoga and Pilates business. And from there knew that there was just one element missing, even though yoga is psychology of the mind, there's one other element missing, which is for me was the coaching. So I embarked on my coaching journey, which was um, gaining qualification in transformational coaching, positive psychology, emotional intelligence, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, NLP, um, master coaching, uh, and yeah, and somatic coaching. Uh, and that's where I would say we're up to date now with the creative genius. It's all about supporting the professional creative when you get to the challenges and you get those things going on in the head that aren't necessarily true, but you believe they are. <laughs> um, helping you understand that you have choice and that you're the one who's in control and making good decisions to move forward um, and I'm passionate about it and I love it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Gloria. Oh, hi, I'm Gloria. My business is the Diffusion Method, which is basically my approach to um, dance and fitness and all this things I do. Um, so I started as a dancer, basically I've been involved in dance for my whole life. And then when I was 20, I became, um, I got my diploma as a teacher. So I started to teach and choreograph and basically was my life seven days a week. And then I, as basically all dancers, I moved into fitness, um, started with Pilates, which is something that we all study usually as dancers. Uh, so basically my life has been split between dance and Pilates for many, many years. Um, then working with my students, I realized there was a lack, especially where I was, so in Italy, where I'm from, there was a lack of uh, knowledge of how to take care of your body as a dancer, especially if you're training to become a professional dancer or if you're already a professional dancer. 
Um, so I started to develop my own method to prepare the body to become an actual professional dancer, to take care of your body while you are dancing professionally. Uh, so I started to teach the, this to my students and then I've been invited to teach uh, workshops and stuff um, in Italy and then abroad. And I started to travel very, very often until I've decided to move abroad, uh, especially because I've never been really into the lifestyle in Italy. It's not really my cup of tea. I think I was born in the wrong country. So I moved to London after traveling many, many um, years. I moved permanently to London. Uh, now I have a son, I have a husband, so I think I'm probably here <laughs> kind of permanently um, but yeah i'm still i'm still uh, doing this i'm i call myself more a dance educator right now because i stopped teaching regular dance classes and i'm more teaching um one-off workshops of uh, um, body preparation i don't like to call it body conditioning because it's more like a mind and body conditioning so something like that so i teach from one off an hour and a half uh, workshops to regular um workshops at um academies or for dance companies and stuff like that um i also of course teach uh, fitness mainly pilates postural kind of clinical pilates um and I also have another business, which is in women's health, because uh, I'm a pre and postnatal specialist, I'm a doula, my husband is a psychologist, so we are doing something together in that kind of context. Like, this is not really about what we're doing today, so I'm not talking about that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I kept it short, I hope, <laughs> and yeah. give you some information. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kate Terry. Hi, um, I hope everyone can hear me. I've got a groggy voice. I'm going to be very brief. Um, started ballet class when I was six years old. I won a five-year scholarship with the RAD. Spent two and a half years at the Royal Ballet Senior School and uh, then went straight into the Royal Ballet, no audition. Spent a few years there. Joined London's Festival Ballet, which is now called English National Ballet. Joined there as a soloist. Spent a few years there, but I wanted to do more. I then went into musical theatre dancing in the West End, UK tours, film and television. I had a forced ending to my career and set up um, a business management organization for people in show business. I ran that for 15 years, after which there was a few years of um, property development and then the crash came, the financial crash. I then decided to retrain as a psychotherapist and I have been a psychotherapist ever since. But it wasn't until 2016 when an ex-dancer came to me after uh, they were discharged from a psychiatric unit that I realised there's something in it. That was my first love, dance, performing, and now the psychotherapy. I put the two together and in 2017 I set up a website called Counselling for Dancers. That's developed into workshops for vocational schools, dance companies. And one of the, the first ones uh, was in November of last year was the Joffrey Ballet School in New York. So I spent two days there with them and it's progressed from there into the UK over to Ireland as well. And now in this shutdown, this lockdown, I've um, been booked to do um, virtual uh, summer intensives. So the summer intensives are virtual and so my workshops uh, are working with that. And honestly I have um, to uh, uh, see majority of my clients are from show business um, and I get referrals from the new uh, equity and BAPAM uh, referral system where equity members can get six free sessions. So that's um, that's a, that's a plus. I just wanted to to put that in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's about it. I can get in these two minutes. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, something I'm going to say about so everyone here. I think everyone will agree that people can see a direct relation between physical body and mental health. Um, they can they can be really 
key impacts and it's all about looking after yourself physically as well as your mental health. Um, so the, the first question we're going to look at is what are some key signs that your health and well-being are not at the optimum level? Um, so the health and well-being can cover both physical and mental. Um, and it's all about, as per the title of this, it's all about building the resilience uh, to keep going. Um, it may be struggling at times, but it's important to make sure you put your health forward uh, before anything else. So I'm just going to go around and just want to discuss what are some of the key signs to show when your health and well-being aren't at the best um, and that, what you can do to sort of counteract that. Uh, so we'll start with Nicolette. Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks for differentiating and really being clear on that physical and mental and, and how it is so much of a whole thing and not segmented. Um, I think that uh, we, we no longer think of optimal health is just being about the absence of illness do we it's so much more as who world health organization are, are saying and defining it it's more about a state of complete physical and mental and social well-being which i think is really important for us to have a, a basic understanding to start with and from that premise i then think that if we were to compartmentalize just those areas about how we can understand each area might be suboptimal. If we think about the mind, for example, how about we ask ourselves some questions that might give us answers that kind of determine it. So what's your thinking like? And is it self-destructive where you don't feel good about yourself in public or even in private most of the time? Or is it quite self-serving where you take responsibility for your daily thoughts and when you do have negative thoughts, you work on shifting them, you make it a work in progress as much as you can. Um, and also, do you look forward to each new day? Because life is rolling, you know, and each day, how are you seeing it and bringing it in? Is it with a sense of curiosity and excitement? Or um, do you actually dread the day before it even begins? Um, are you sleeping soundly at night? Is it interrupted? How much deliberate quiet time are you giving yourself, you know, during whenever you're living? And also from a physical perspective, what's your physicality like? And when you see yourself in the mirror, naked or clothed, what, what, what impression do you have of yourself? And whatever the answer is, are you making peace with that? You know, are you being kind to yourself about it? Um, physicality again, exercise. Are you exercising? Are you doing things to support your um, energy levels and your physicality? At least, what, recommended 30 minutes a day at least? So are you able to put that into your body? Um, water, how much water are you drinking? Because we understand how important that is. We're made up majority of water. Um, how much fresh produce are you actually eating? Um, is most of it shelled? And then I think if we look from a social perspective, how often are you speaking to other people? Um, and when you do speak with them, how are they supporting your outlook on yourself? Is it from a positive or from a negative perspective? And then also, how are you feeling when you're not socialising as well? And do you have positive support networks? Can you talk to those people in a really supportive way where you don't feel judged and you don't feel like they're going to fix you? So I think if when you answer a lot of those questions, you come up with things that are quite negative, it might be that there is some, some, some sub-optimal health and well-being areas that could give a, have a little MOT. And uh, it's an opportunity for you to just take a moment and think about how you can make some shifts if you're seeing things you're not quite happy with or comfortable with. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just now, <laughs> just uh, people, uh, I just want to introduce Erin here, who's from One Dance UK. Uh, do you want to just give a brief introduction to yourself, Erin? Hi, Erin. Hi, uh, I'm so sorry I'm late. I just had another uh, meeting. Um, but I work at One Dance UK. I'm the manager of health, well-being, and performance there. And One Dance UK is a sector support organization. And what that means is we're supposed to look after everyone in the dance sector. So that means people who are participating in dance for fun, 
people who are training to become professionals in any aspect of dance. So that could be as a performer, as a choreographer, as a teacher, um, and also all of the professionals in those various areas. So performers, artists, teachers, managers, producers. Um, we're supposed to look after the lot um, across dance and all of its various forms. So we have a really big job and the way that we carry out that job is through um, support from expert panels. So my work in physical and mental health is supported by One Dance UK's um, Dance Medicine and Science Expert Panel, as well as the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science. Um, and so we educate people about health and well-being from a mental and a physical perspective. We also provide clinical services via the NHS and um, via our uh, private healthcare practitioners directory and also by signposting to other excellent practitioners um, and, and resources. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you very much. Um, so we're just on the question on what are some key signs that your health and well-being are not at the optimum level. Uh, we've just heard from Nicolette, so if we can just hear from Gloria. Yes, sorry, just unmuted. So I agree to every single thing that Nicolette said, uh, and uh, I will just add something that is really uh, related to what I do as a job in the dance industry. Uh, sometimes when I teach my uh, workshops, uh, I've noticed that some dancers, they feel that they are constantly injured, like not severe injuries, I mean, that's something that we we can avoid, but sometimes they just happen, but just like very small things, but constantly. And that is a sign that something is not working, that you're pushing your body in the way you shouldn't. And sometimes they feel that even after a long warm up, they're still really, really tense. And that is another sign. I mean, if after a warm up, after meditating, after all the exercises that you're doing to prepare your body, to, for the class or to go on stage or for the rehearsal or whatever, you still feel really tense. Of course, you're gonna have this feeling of having constantly like injuries. So, you know, when you have this kind of signs, it's not just that your body isn't right. There is something that your mind is trying to tell you. So try to not to ignore this kind of things. So that is definitely something. And then the constant tiredness, I mean, as dancers, as performers, we are tired because we work really hard with our body. So it's totally normal. And uh, of course we need to eat healthy. We need to sleep properly. something that I haven't done when I was uh, younger. And that was my regret. I was constantly like, uh, you know, skipping to sleep, do stuff. And that is uh, the worst thing you can do. But anyway, of course you feel a lot tired, you know, because of that. But if you have this constant feeling of tiredness and uh, as Nicolette said something similar if you start your day already tired you can't wait for the end of the day we all have this kind of days but it can't be something that you experience every single day of the week so if you have these signs maybe it's time to do something about your mental health and we're probably talking about this later but yeah those are the signs that I noticed a lot with the students I'm training Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Terry? I think Nicolette and uh, Gloria have covered most things, uh, which is brilliant that we're all reading from the same song sheet. There are some other things, but that I think will be covered in, the, hopefully covered in, in the mental health aspect. This question is just to do with recognizing it. So perhaps sleeping too much, not wanting to get out of bed, so that's that's the depressive side of things. Pressure gets too much. You know, we all carry to a certain degree a mask. We mask things from ourselves. So when Gloria was saying about having lots of injuries, in my sessions I get the clients and the patients to talk to themselves, but in the thoughts in the head, there's an intrinsic link between the mind and the body. So the mind's trying to tell you something and we ignore it. And that then starts a downward spiral. So I'll leave that there because the other two covered it beautifully. And finally, uh, Erin. Um, I'd agree with what Nicolette and Gloria and Terry have all said. Um, I agree that you have to listen to your body. I think overall well-being points that Nicolette was, was making when I joined, I just couldn't agree with more. I think 
our minds and our physical health are interconnected in ways that we still don't understand fully. And that, that aspect of things is something that I think it's really easy to miss. We sort of compartmentalize the things that are going wrong and we think that that can't possibly have anything to do with anything else. And um, I would also really echo what Terry was saying about the importance of being aware of your thoughts and how valuable that awareness can be because you don't necessarily need to change them. You don't necessarily need to fix them, but as a very first step, being aware of them and listening to them is so important because I think, especially among dancers, I've observed anecdotally that we're really good at ignoring some of those feelings, those, those things that could be warning signs, could keep us from going too far over the edge. We're really good at sort of pushing them away and saying, no, no, that's not, that's not important. I need to work harder. I need to try harder. I need to do more. I need to be like that other person. And that causes us to kind of ignore what we're feeling on the inside. And that can be so detrimental. So I really, really agree with Terry on that as well. Um, I think some other maybe signs that I would also talk about are, are losing your motivation. Like we are usually doing dance or the arts because we love it. And that's usually the reason people start doing this job or this activity. And when you start to lose that love, that's another sign that I think you really have to be aware of that, oh, I really don't want to get up today and do this. I really don't care about this anymore. I used to really love doing this and I don't anymore. Those kinds of loss of, of drive or motivation or meaning from things you used to love are big signs of burnout. And I think, Gloria, you were talking about burnout as well. And I just really, I think that's a really big sign that people often miss. They kind of go, oh, well, I'm not supposed to love it because it's supposed to be hard and it's supposed to be this graft. And we forget that. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Erin. Um, so, so, something I, I'm wanting to distinguish between is mental health usually comes with a stigma of constantly being negative. Um, whereas mental health is both when you're positive and you're negative. You can re have really positive mental health. Um, which brings me into the next question. Uh, what advice can you give slash what does your business offer to those concerned about mental health and the performing arts? So whether that is a negative experience they're undertaking or whether it's how to handle overexcitement, enjoyment, because some people do have that. Some people get overexcited and may feel like they're going too fast too soon. And that'll start them into a negative spiral. Um, I know I've had that myself in uh, yeah. many projects working here. Um, so I'm just wondering what advice you'd give on um, for those who are concerned about their mental health. Uh, not so much COVID related yet. That's more of a question for later. But in terms of their general practice, how would, what kind of tips would you give them on managing their mental health? Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with Nicolette. Yeah, sure. Um, I think managing your mental health, I think that it's really important to stay connected, actually. Um, connection is, is one of the three human needs. And I think if we can stay connected to family, friends, colleagues, the world, the environment, not alienate ourselves, disconnect ourselves, shut ourselves off, then we will have more opportunities to create a change of state and a change of the way you view your world. Um, I think if you cannot get that support from connecting with people around you in your environment, in your community, without feeling like you are judged or you, um, they are trying to fix you, or you know, uh, the critical stuff, then there are organizations out there who you can talk to and support. And there's also people like us on the panel who do this working with this specific group to support them. So yeah, I, I think it's about one of, the, one of the prime things I think is about staying connected and not distancing yourself from people around you. Um, but I know that there are many other ways to support your mental health. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go on to Gloria. Yes. So, well, basically, I think one of the things I learned when I was a dance student myself, it was when, when I used to go to the dance studio earlier than my first class and spend a little bit of time with my 
colleagues and friends or even just alone if I was the first one and just getting ready like not only body wise but mentally wise so the mindset mm-hmm. was ready for the class or for the bunch of classes when you're training to become professional of course there's a lot of classes you know, one after you know back-to-back classes uh it was a there was a huge difference between the days when I could do this so get myself ready for that and the days when I couldn't the outcome of the class itself was completely different and this is something that I mean I agree to everything that Nicolette said so I'm just trying to add something else I mean getting ready for the day body wise and mentally wise is what is helping you first of all to keep your mind healthy and second to notice if something is wrong with you, with your mental health so as we said previously be aware of what is happening in your head is the most important thing the first thing so basically having that time to get ready for the day especially because it's really intense as a performer is uh, probably the best thing you can do so if you notice that something is wrong it might be just one day but if you notice this for a few days in a row then you know that you have to do something and so you have the chance to kind of fix it, not fix it, I don't like the word fix it, but you know what I mean, uh, in time, so to seek for help, so that's that kind of thing, so you know, I think this is my advice. Yeah, um, before I move to Terry, I, I was just thinking then, um, I, I agree with you when not saying the word fix, because that sort of insinuates that it's broken, um, yeah. which no human can ever be broken, um, but it's more of a matter of development on developing yourself and developing your inner belief and your inner mental health to support your like career goal, your practice, what you do, and to believe in what you do going forward. Uh, so yeah, I really, really take agree. care of yourself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I much likely this one. Yeah. Um, so moving on to Terry. Okay, I'll go with everything that's. Uh... Gloria and Nicolette said, but I'm going to put a different angle on this. We are driven by what is wired into our brains. We are all on the neurodiverse spectrums to a certain degree, each individually to a certain degree. These spectrums include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and autism. So when, anecdotally, when I see clients, there seems to be an attraction to dance because of its discipline, because of its black and white thinking, especially ballet. Now these traits can then be exacerbated. We need these traits, they drive us, they help us get where we want to. But when they carry too far, they then become detrimental. If you think of the black and white thinking of perfectionism, of I've got to be thin, and then you go into uh, eating disorders, there's a very black and white thinking, very narrow there. And my feeling is when children start at three, four, five, six, et cetera, if they're not in the right position, they're wrong. So there's a right and a wrong, which then knocks down their self-esteem because they're always wrong. Some people take corrections well, some people don't. So it's a way of thinking which is driven by the wiring in the brain. This can be changed. So when you ask the question, what advice can you give? You have to understand yourself more. You have to understand what you're capable physically of doing and not compare to someone who is totally different. You have to understand that each one of us is unique. So everyone listening to this is unique. You cannot be the same as anyone else. You may do three pirouettes to the right the same as anyone else, but what's the difference? There are differences. So by understanding yourself a lot more, and you also ask, Josh, what does your business offer? So people don't have to be mentally unwell or have well-being issues, but they can come to me to help them with the way that they think. I know, I think Nicolette probably does something similar, but I use a lot of visualizations and I mentioned in an earlier answer about mind and body link and talking to your body. That then helps them understand 
what they can do. And I think my voice is giving out, so I'll stop there. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, I agree with you there as well on the ever growing image of perfectionism. Um, it's, it's still increasing today, and that hasn't helped with the use of social media. Um, including correct. People don't see it as a big issue, but TikTok is actually becoming an increasing area where people are looking for perfectionism in their movement. Um, and people are getting comments about that and comments on their performance. And it, it becomes more detrimental the more you use it. So maybe it's also on about budgeting your time that you spend on social media. But that could be a whole new discussion for another day, social media. Josh, can I just add something else that just came to mind? Yes, when you have a day off, have a day off. Don't do Pilates. Don't do cross training. Try and talk to someone outside of the business. Make friends with non-dancers. Yeah. Get a new perspective of life. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Erin. Right. So I'm going to approach this from a slightly different perspective as well. Um, just because of the way that One Dance UK works and the National Institute works, um, we support lots of different people in different ways to kind of uh, talk about mental health and the performing arts. And so you can kind of uh, think of it as a Venn diagram. So you have the people who are um, using mental health support services as end users, and that might be a dance student or a professional dancer or a choreographer or a manager, human beings essentially. And you also have those people who offer those mental health support services. So counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, psychotherapists, um, life coaches, a uh, broad variety of people. Um, you also have leaders who create environments, psychological environments, whether that's in a rehearsal studio or a dance classroom or a professional environment who have a big impact uh, being gatekeepers on the mental health and the working conditions of dancers. Um, and then finally, you have sort of what I would call sort of overarching gatekeepers. So those would be artistic directors, employers, um, producers, uh, people who make decisions about casting. Um, and those people are kind of working within a broader framework, a government structure, an employment structure, an organizational structure. And fundamentally, I think the most important thing that we try to help people understand through our work is that everyone has a responsibility for mental health. It is not just the responsibility of, say, the mental health professional to know what dancers are going through and to understand their needs. It is also the responsibility of the dance teacher, the choreographer, the artistic director, the rehearsal director, to create an environment that is psychologically safe and supportive and to understand that that's a part of their job. It's also very important for organizations, for schools, for companies, for government, to understand the mental health needs of the people that they're looking after. So what are the specific mental health needs for performers, for dancers, for people in the dance sector, for humans, because obviously dancers are human beings as well. So there are human issues that dancers go through that are things like depression or anxiety that everyone goes through, but there are also performance anxiety issues or depression that's related to a loss within dance. So all of those things are our responsibilities. There's also a responsibility for those dancers, those performers, those people in the dance sector to seek help and to be supported to seek help. So there's group responsibility there. And I guess what we try to do through our work is to support everyone to be able to be more aware of those things, to take advantage of training, to have education and resources that help them to find mental health support to have a guidance about what mental health support means because it can be quite scary if you've never sought mental health care support to know even where to go. Do I go to my GP? Do I try and find a counselor online? Do I go to a charity like mine? Do I look at arts minds or industry minds for support and guidance? Where do I go? So trying to signpost, trying to provide education and information, and also trying to advocate to government to help them make better decisions about something as fundamental as working conditions. Um, there are brilliant groups, and I know Levy isn't here, but Dancers Network does a brilliant job of trying to look after the needs of the mental health and physical health, as well as working conditions needs 
of those in the commercial dance sector, um, as well as equity, which I know Terry has just done a brilliant session for um, looking at mental health. So they have a dancers committee, committee through equity that provides support for those dancers who maybe work in those equity contracts. So there's a lot of sort of different areas of support out there and signposting people to the right support for them, whether that's in their organization or outside of it, is something we try to do. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're moving on to something more current, um, so very specific to the current uh, environment. So COVID-19, we were discussing this before we went live, um, and we were discussing the impact on ourselves and the businesses that we run um, and a lot of people's like mental health may have taken an impact um, like quite a negative impact because of this because of like we were discussing earlier connections you, you, you start to isolate yourself even if it wasn't intentional you don't mm -hmm. you don't build up that um that social media standing to be able to just message people if you feel like you need it um, so that brings me to the next question of what advice can you give people who may feel their mental health not be at the best at the moment because of COVID-19 lockdown? Uh, we'll start with uh, Nicolette, please. Sure. Thanks, Josh, for asking that question. I think that this panel is very much about using the, the resource and the strength of resilience to, to get through our, our everyday, our life, and especially COVID-19 at the moment, if you feel that your mental health is impacted. And I think one of the really essential components of building resilience is self-compassion. This, it's, it's a very powerful uh, and strong tool and strength that we have within inside. And I say inside that way, because often we look outside for resources. And we forget that actually the human body is able to self-heal and it's able to know what's going on intuitively. Um, and when I work with my clients, I work with them somatically as well, which is understanding the language of the body. So as Terry was saying, this understanding of what's going on inside the body to know whether these thoughts or this feeling is a positive one that serves me. So from a self-compassion perspective, if you are experiencing mental health concerns at this moment, I think if you can take some time to be really kind to yourself, to uh, have some nourishing thoughts and to really give yourself the opportunity to know that actually this situation hasn't been caused by you. It's something totally out of your control, but there are things that you are able to control and your inner strengths is one of them. So how could you use them? And really stepping into some self-compassion. Um, and another reason for self-compassion, I think, is because the more you focus on nourishing yourself and being kind to yourself, it's gonna take you away from those debilitating emotions that can take over in life. And it brings you, it gives you more space to fill yourself with gratitude and happiness and all those wonderful things that take you closer towards positive mental health and further away from the detrimental stuff. Amazing, thank you. Um, Claudia? Yeah, so, well, this is a huge topic. We could talk for hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, anyway, I think the good thing is that we are all kind of working in a different way, even though we do all similar stuff. So I mm -hmm. guess that is the most important thing today because, uh, you know, as in the same way, there is no, you know, one single way to train our body to achieve certain things. It's the same for mental health. So what can work for me, maybe is not working for someone else. So maybe if I, you know, give an advice, it might be great for someone and definitely the wrong thing for someone else. So it's good that we're all, saying different things. Um, as I said, I'm also a pre and postnatal specialist. So over this lockdown, I've been talking to a lot of mothers to be your new moms, and that is a whole another word, and uh, is a very tough moment for them as well. And sometimes I was giving completely different advices to different people because they needed to hear different things. So that is something that we need to keep in mind, I guess. 
um, when I was talking to my students over this lockdown, I said, first of all, like try not to do like a thousand of virtual classes every day because that is not helping. That is not helping because it's quite frustrating. First of all, because there are like internet connection problems and stuff like that. You can't maybe understand properly what the teacher is asking you to do. The teacher can't correct you in the way you used to receive correction. So that is frustrating mm -hmm. and you might feel that you're not working properly. So try not to exaggerate. There are tons of free virtual classes, you know, that I've, I've done quite a few of them. But I always say when I teach a live class uh, for a brand or whatever, I always say, don't push yourself. Take this as a hobby, something that we do to have fun and keep on moving together. But don't push yourself too much. Don't exaggerate in that way because otherwise you will be extremely tired and probably a little bit upset at the end of the tunnel when all this will be over. So try not to be too, you know, like not to stress out of I need to keep on doing stuff. So if you feel that you want to calm down, calm down. Um, then of course, use the time to do the things that you never have the time to do. I know that this is probably the sentence that we've all been saying for like, you know, the whole lockdown. But in the same way, try not to like, decide something that you really want to achieve. Like I always say to my students, uh, try to use this time, for example, if you know that your weakness is, um, I don't know, like feet or ankles, let's say something really like popular, uh, you can definitely work to improve your situation, to get stronger, but try not to set a specific point that you want to reach because otherwise you would be completely frustrated, really upset. If you won't be able, maybe you're tired, maybe you have something else to do, maybe you don't have the tools to reach that goal because you don't have your teacher teachers with you or whatever. So set your goals, but try to be kind with you. And I'm connected to what Nicolette said. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to get stronger, if you want to improve, do it, but try to remember that this is not the time to set certain goals. And then if you have the, the kind of person, this is the last thing I'm going to say, if you, have, if you are the kind of person that needs goals and projects, I'm like that. I'm like, not because I need to, but because I always have tons of ideas in my head and I need to have projects and stuff like that. It's hard to set projects on a short term right now because we don't know exactly when we will be able to do certain things. So set goals and projects, but very long term. So let's say in two years time, I would really want to whatever, create that choreography with my friends. Start to do that or anything else. I want to go back to school, whatever. Work on that. Start to write down something, start to collect information, so stuff like that. So you have something that keeps you alive, but you won't again you won't be upset if at the end of the lockdown you haven't reached that point and try to do something every day as um i think terry said something like that earlier try to do something every day that is not related to dance or performing arts so something that you really like treat yourself whatever it is watching a movie read a book or bake a cake whatever it is but try to do something that is completely not related to the situation we are living or to your job. These are my advices. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, something you said earlier um, was about how different people will probably need different advice and they'll probably need to hear different things um, because some of them may believe they're not good enough. Um, and you may have to speak to them about how um, it's all about self-improvement and it's all about setting your own goals, not having to listen to the peer pressure. But some people may be like, um, oh other people around me aren't really doing this as this and it'll be all about telling them the right thing to hear not just a generic blanket statement saying this is going to be fine it's all going to be unique statements unique advice to give to each individual person um okay thank you very much uh terry okay so the question you put was what advice for people in the performing arts suffering from mental health issues now, if there's extreme mental health issues, the first thing you do is ask for help. That's a, such a brave step for some people to ask for help. Contact a mental health practitioner, as I've mentioned before, Equity do the six sessions for Equity members. Um, and Erin mentioned some links 
as well to mental health practitioners that understand performing artists. But the less unwell people who is, it just thinks are getting on top of them. Wonderful advice from Nicolette and Gloria, and I'm sure Erin will come up with something similar, maybe something different as well. Um, I've written down a few things here, and I think it, uh, Nicolette and Gloria have already covered some of them. There's an important thing. We can't control what's going on now. It's understanding what we can control and what we can change. So we need the inner strength to be able to understand and to change things that we can. So Nicolette and Gloria gave some advice on that. And don't think about the things you can't change. If you can't change them, avoid thinking about them. Easy for me to say, but when you gradually start doing that, you realize that is set aside. Now, what can I do? And you can go forward. So there's a number of things. Some of them have already been mentioned. Think about five things that you've had to change in your life since lockdown. What out of those five have been working so well that you can keep? So you think about that. Gratitude was mentioned. Each day at the end of the day, think of the three things that you are grateful for. Even if it's just a meal on the table, hot water, something simple. But think of three things. We spoke about routine as well. Don't overdo your routine. Two classes, three classes, whatever. If you're in a vocational school, you'll be getting two or three classes a day anyway. And as I mentioned in a previous question, when you have a day off, have a day off. Don't do anything. Rest your body and your mind. Um, Gloria mentioned about there's so many online courses, nothing to do with dance, something that you're interested in, painting, drawing, um, garden, anything like that. Try something different. Keep in contact with family and friends. That's uh, Nicolette, I think, mentioned that a lot earlier. It's, it's that contact, the human need. I think uh, human givens um, has, has an idea about contact. Going back to the beginning of my answer, if you are really suffering, ask for help. Okay, Josh. Thank you very much. Uh, Evan, family, thank you. Um, yeah, I think everybody has really covered it essentially brilliantly. And I just have to add to a couple of things that have already been said. Um, in terms of seeking help, I think sometimes it can be really intimidating to try and figure out how to seek help. And I think sometimes people try out one practitioner, they seek help from one kind of practitioner or one person, and they have a bad experience. And they think that means that it's not going to, that that seeking help thing isn't going to work for them. Um, and actually what I would, what I would remind people of is that um, the efficacy, the value of mental health services are often about the relationship that you build with the person that you're speaking to. And that might be that you find a counselor that really gets you and really understands you and really hears you, um, or you find that your GP does that for you, or you find that perhaps there's a, a mental health specialist, psych psychotherapist that does that really well. Just keep looking for the right person if at first you don't find that good connection because the point most of the time with mental health support is that you need to find somebody that, that you feel comfortable and that you can trust. And it's, uh, I think that's something that people don't always embrace or necessarily understand about seeking help. Um, I'd also remind people that there are lots of avenues for finding help. If you're not quite sure where to look, the NHS has a really brilliant uh, website which lists all of the mental health free hotlines that are run by charities, and there are 50 of them. So you could just go down that list if you want to try and find help and you're not quite sure where to look. Um, you could also go onto MIND's website. MIND has a brilliant and very comprehensive resource of information. Um, Arts Minds also has some really brilliant information for um, individuals working in the performing arts. The British Association for Performing Arts Medicine does a brilliant job of signposting to various types of healthcare support that people might need. Because I think one of the things we haven't talked about about COVID-19 is why you may not be feeling well. And I think Nicolette was talking about this when we first started some of the key signs about health and well-being not being optimum. But I think some 
some issues that are arising for people in COVID-19 have to do with maybe the loss of their identity. Like right now, lots of dancers can't perform, they can't train, they can't rehearse. And so they've lost what it is to be a dancer. And for most dancers, as we've sort of talked about, for most people in dance, should I say, um, not just those on stage, but most people in dance identify very strongly as that role. And if they can't do that thing, they often feel very bereft, like they've actually lost someone or something about themselves. And that loss of identity can be really damaging. And often people don't even realize that's why they're upset, that that loss of that thing that's been so important to them makes them feel like they don't know who they are or what they are. And you might also, as a person in lockdown, be struggling with a feeling of loneliness or social isolation. You might be struggling with the fact that maybe you wanted to accomplish something. You had a goal that you were going to achieve or you needed, you felt like you needed to achieve to be able to take the next step. So I needed to graduate from this, this degree or this institution so that I could take the next step into my career or I needed to get an agent so that I could be successful in my professional life. I needed to go for that audition because that audition only comes up this time of year. Um, I needed to get that job because this was the only time that job had been available. And I think those kinds of things, those missed opportunities and those lost chances can also make us feel a sense, a great sense of loss or almost bereavement. And I would just really echo what Terry said about seeking help because I think there still is a lot of stigma around mental health and in the way that people feel very comfortable going to a physiotherapist or a massage therapist or someone to talk about their physical health. You know, if you've got asthma, you go to your GP and you get help for that. But people don't think about that the same way if they're feeling anxious or they're feeling low or depressed. It is an illness and it is a problem that you can, you can get help for. And just don't forget that and know that that no one who is gonna help you is gonna judge you. And the people that genuinely care about you won't judge you and will help you. So I think that's, that's a couple of just additions to all the other brilliant stuff that's been said. Thank you very much. So I'm just time to just, uh, sorry, someone speaking. Uh, sorry, I, I was just gonna ask if I could just offer something additional to Erin, if I could just add something, yeah, that's yeah, all right. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, she's talking, um, thank you, Erin, for that. Um, totally concur with it. And the loss of identity and all the other wonderful things that you brought to light about what people might be experiencing, which could cause them to start feeling that, that, that they're not enough and things aren't going right. Um, I just wanted to add um, a few steps, really, I didn't mention before about when you get to that point. For example, you were talking about loss of identity you know, start to write down the thing that is really concerning you. So if you can take a moment to actually identify what it is that is the issue, once you've identified it, then actually bring in the self-compassion of where you realize you're in pain and you want to relieve the pain. And with kindness, start remembering that COVID-19 is out of your control. And as Terry was saying, that you have some things that you can control and your strengths are one of them. And then just start to focus on what you can actually control. And I would also say choose people around you who can really support you and also be accountability buddies for whatever you want to move into and step into. And then one of the, I think, uh, things I really would like to, to, to share is about taking action. Become informed about the situation. So we often feel quite helpless, but we're not. And if you start to do some research, ask people around you who are in the same situation and how they're coping with it, be in, become informed so that you can start to take more control and you can feel like you can take the control. Um, and then when you get to the point where you think you've got something tangible to work with, how about starting to break it down into bite-sized portions so you don't feel overwhelmed by it. And as you do that, create some stability in your day because there is a lot of uncertainty going on. And then just to finish, this thing about being curious, you know, as creatives, creativity comes from a sense of curiosity. So being playful and curious about what it is that you're stepping into, this newness. And 
I think because it's uncertain times right now, how can you find certainty within this space of uncertainty? And so just really taking action so that you bring the power back to yourself and don't allow the anxiety or the fear or the frustration to become powerful. You're the one who is in control and you're powerful. So thank you for giving me that time just to add those things. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so just got the time conscious. Uh, so the next section is tips on a healthy work, um, work and life balance. Because as we all know, some of us like to overwork. I know I like to wear the work. So, you know, uh, yeah. It's so what I'm going to try and do is if everyone can just come up with even if it's just um, two or three tips on how to ensure a healthy work life balance. Um, yeah. Let's start from the bottom and work our way up this time. So let's start from Evan. Surprise me there. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> so I would I would suggest, and, and I need to state here uh, very clearly and for all of my other comments as well, that I am not a therapist or a mental health specialist. I'm a manager with an interest in mental health. Um, and uh, as such, I would present these as personal uh, recommendations rather than um, anything to do with us or coming from a background of having a qualification. Um, I find mindfulness to be really helpful. Um, presentness in the moment is something that really helps me to calm my sense of anxiety or nerves. Um, I also find kind of breathing and staying in touch with my body. So um, I find myself sitting and doing Zoom sessions for like really large chunks of time right now or working really intensely at my computer for large chunks of time right now. And to stand up, to take 15 minutes of every hour to move, to breathe, to look at something else, to go outside, to experience what it's like outside of the room that I'm in with my computer. Um, is really powerful. Um, I'd also say that one of the things that I have heard recently from a brilliant practitioner called uh, Irina Roncaglia, who's a, a psychotherapist, or excuse me, a performance psychologist, um, she suggests acting according to your plan rather than how you're feeling. So um, those feelings of depression or anxiety or nerves or upset or happy, they can in really sort of push me around in terms of how I approach my tasks for the day. And um, it really helps me to remind myself, okay, this is the plan. Even if I'm not feeling great today, even if I'm feeling really excited today and like, ah, head up and, and overwhelmed, um, I just need to do my plan. I just take those things off. Um, and then I also remind myself of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So sometimes when things matter to us a lot, um, that can make us feel more um, sort of intense about those things and about the outcomes of those things. And I remind myself, why am I doing this? What is the ultimate outcome that I wanna see? And why is that important to me? You know, in my life, I value my family. I value trying to look after people and help people. So how does what I'm doing right now support that? And, and kind of match with those values. Because if I'm doing something that matches with my values and I'm doing it because of something that's coming from inside me, a motive that's intrinsic or internal to me, then I'm gonna be more per persistent at it. I'm going to be more consistent in it. I'm going to enjoy it more. And that comes from self-determination theory, which is a kind of theory of motivation, but I really have found that to be true. And so that is really my guiding force. Why am I doing this thing? Is it because I love it, because I want to do it, because it matches with my values? And if yes, then I'm gonna I'm gonna be much more successful and happier in it. So those would be my things. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, Terry. Um, I think most of the things about work-life balance have been said throughout these sessions and the answers have been given. Uh, wonderful, Erin, yes, I was going to suggest mindfulness, uh, meditation, even if it's for 10, 15 minutes, that's a daily practice. Um, the work-life balance. Be kind to yourself. I think that is the essence. Be kind to yourself. Don't push yourself. And I've reiterated something that I've said before. On to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, Gloria. Yeah, so 
Well, I have to say that way before the lockdown, when I started my career, I was really bad at balancing work and life. <laughs> so I have to say that I was like just working seven days a week, no matter what, no holidays, no going out with friends, stuff like that. But I was happy. I was happy because, you know, like I was my job was really my passion. I was really happy with that. But then uh, I actually started to realize that I couldn't carry on like that forever. But it was only when I became a mom that I actually learned to really find the balance between the two things because I had no option other than doing that. And I realized that I can be a professional. I can be good at what I do, even if I'm not doing seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So that was uh, the most important thing that I've learned. And in terms of uh, how to balance work and life, especially right now that you are in lockdown, I agree with Erin. A lot of meditation helped me a lot at the beginning of the lockdown because you know, going from working outside, having your own routine to moving everything online or virtually or rearrange your routine is quite hard. And you might find that you don't have this separation from work and home anymore, all these things. So the first few days a week, I was doing a lot of meditation. Every time my baby was napping, I was meditating and stuff like that. And that was really, really helpful the first few days and week. And then I started to basically treat my day as I was working outside. When I have to teach a class, I have to teach a class. When I have to do something, even like, you know, cooking or cleaning or whatever, uh, I have something on my to-do list for every single day of the week. So I'm trying not to say today I have to do like a thousand things. Every Sunday I try to put stuff and split them, you know, like spread them around the weekly schedule. And then uh, the most important thing that I think we need to, to do is, as um, Terry said, be kind to ourselves. And one way to do this is allow yourself to move stuff around. So you know that that day you want to do those certain um, certain things perfect if you don't feel like it if you are really tired if you just want to have you know like a couple of days or uh, um, hours off or whatever just check the rest of the week check if you have the time to do that specific thing another day at another time and just like literally write it down on that day at that time and you will be fine as long as you know that you will have the time because otherwise of course what can happen is that you keep on moving and moving and moving that one day you're just exploding because you have you, you still have deadlines we're still working we still have stuff to do so be kind to yourself move stuff around if you want to but be sure that you find the time for them so you can also enjoy your hours off if you know that you will be able to do that thing another day another time otherwise it will be still on the back of your head and you're like i have to do this thing i have to do that thing but I really don't want to do right now. It's just more stressful than just, you know, doing it and not resting. So I think that is probably the best advice I can give that at least is working for me. Thank you very much. And uh, Nicolette. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I love that answer that Gloria just given about giving yourself permission. That's definitely a one. Um, meditation for me is uh, an essential as part of my way of life. And so I would highly concur with those who were talking about meditation um, and, and add, uh, what about creating a morning ritual? And morning doesn't actually have to mean when you get up in the morning because people do shift work, people are working different times and, you know, especially in this time, things have shifted a lot. So your morning, uh, whatever that means to you, what if you incorporate some meditation in that or quiet or sitting down or writing a journal, etc. Just doing something like that can really allow you to reflection time and to hear what's going on and not to be afraid of what you're hearing either, more to acknowledge it and to make it your friend rather than something you want to push away. Thoughts are, are not bad. <laughs> they, they are what they are. So um, it's how you adapt to them and, and how they impact you. And some other stuff that I just like to quickly add is um, I wrote some stuff down was um, say no more often, um, I think is a really important thing um, because that, that thing of things piling up and piling up and constantly doing until overwhelm kicks in and tiredness kicks in and then you're angry with someone for no reason and that's an impact and it just literally spirals. So being kinder to yourself, giving yourself permission to just say no, I'm not able to do it. 
And, you know, there is a way of saying no, where you can actually just say thank you to the person for considering you and thinking of you. And maybe you need 24 hours to think about it, or maybe you know there and then that unfortunately you're not able to deal with that or to um, accept that offer at the moment. But learning to say no, I think, is really important. Also, decide how much sleep you need. Sleep, I think, is one of the paramount um, uh, 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 impacts on your mental health, sleep deprivation. And so see how much sleep do you need? They say eight, but you might not need eight to be able to function effectively. What do you need? And then make it happen. Start to incorporate it in your day so that you go to bed at a certain time and wake at a certain time and see how you can create a, ritual, a schedule there for yourself. Also creating boundaries. When we don't have boundaries, that's often when we become hurt, upset, frustrated, etc. So how can you create boundaries, not only in work, but in your personal life as well for those around you? And the last one is trusting your intuition, trusting that you do know best and that what is within you is good for you because it's you that matters. And if you are whole and you are complete, then you are more effective to those around you and you can contribute to your community so much more effectively with positive mental health. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, So I'm just looking at the agenda of the questions that we have. Uh, The next question we pretty much just answered anyway about advice you give to your younger self on the work-life balance. Um, I think we've all said. I've I've actually got one for that, which is a personal thing. Were you going to ask it, Josh? Uh, I was going to give a quick Bounce around, yeah. Who? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so let's start with you, Nicola. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I, thought, I thought you were going to say, we've answered that one, move on. So um, one of the things that I realised when I was great, um, when I was moving up in the ranks of work and management and then running your own business and all of that sort of stuff was remember that you're not a martyr. You don't have to do it all yourself. And it's the one thing that I remember telling myself, I can delegate. I don't have to own this. And if I want to own it so much, I need to look at myself and work out what it is I'm afraid of losing or is it control? What am I fearful of? And of course I did all of that and was able to let it go. I don't have to do it all myself. So don't be a martyr. Let it go, let it go, is what I said, without a doubt. That's one of the biggest things. Um, and also um, consider what makes you happy and do more of it. Brilliant. Uh, Gloria, anything to add? I think I I missed your question. Which question we're at? Uh, it's, it's just um, what advice would you give to yourself, your younger self? Oh, okay. Well. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, actually, um, I was thinking about that when I had a look at your question, and uh, to be honest, I have to say that because I'm happy where I'm at right now, I wouldn't do anything differently. I have to say, and it hasn't been easy. It has been a bumpy ride, and you know, and everything. But at the same time, I wouldn't change anything. Probably one thing is that I've, um, like, as, as Nicola said, do, you know, like, more of what you love and all these things. And I was really happy with, like, working seven days a week on my project. And most of my work was basically for free, because it was, you know, for, like, you know, next project, stuff like that. Um, So I was already happy, and I was already doing what I was loving uh but i was for example i was traveling a lot uh before work always uh, i was either for you know joining workshops as a student or to teach as a guest teacher and i used to you know like work uh until the very last minute and then you know running to the airport taking the flight and then coming back and going straight away back to the studio and stuff like that probably that is something that i would have change like taking a few extra days either before or after the actual trip to just you know like calm down and enjoy the situation think about the next steps because otherwise i would do that during the night wasting you know hours of sleep and now that i'm almost two years in sleep deprivation because of my son i really regret that i haven't slept so basically that is probably uh, the advice to myself so probably this can help other people to, you know, um, to think about what you actually love and do a little bit more of that because maybe one day you won't have the time to do that things anymore. Uh, so maybe that is the only 
advice I would give myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Terry? Um, as part of my training as a psychotherapist, I had to complete four years of weekly therapy myself. This, I now realize, should have happened when I gave up dancing because the loss, as um, Erin mentioned, the loss of identity. I had withdrawal symptoms for four years. I then just got onto something else and plowed through, just pushed myself through. And only when I started training as a psychotherapist and had that therapy did I realize I needed to have therapy then. That's what I would tell my younger self. Things would have changed, obviously, but I'm here now. I may not have been here now if I was back there. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, Evan. Um, short and sweet here. Um, I would say to myself that um, I should value myself like a commodity and love myself in that way. Because I think we, uh, especially in our, in, in my younger days, I wouldn't say for anyone else, but uh, I didn't value myself. And I still think that I don't value myself enough. And um, we are important, we are valuable, we are meaningful. And I think when you, when you live your life in a way that honors that and values that, that contribution that you make to your environment, to your friends, to your family, to your work, to your home life, you make different decisions. If you know that you're valuable and if you are comfortable with that value, you don't run yourself into the ground because you know that you're valuable. You know that people need you. You know that you have something important to offer them. When you know that you're valuable, you don't take abuse from people, whether that's an abusive relationship or um, a situation that just doesn't serve you. Um, and you also maybe take care of yourself a bit better. And that might be with your mental health. That might be with what you eat. That might be with how much time you give yourself to rest. I think self-value, self-actualization is so important. And I'm still working on that. And I just, I wish I had started younger. I wish I had started earlier. I think that's just the most important thing to know how valuable you are and to be confident in, in acting on that value. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm just going to say before we move on to the next section, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Um, I'll be able to read them as we go along. But what I just want to cover first is um, where can we find support during this time and afterwards? Um, so it's like we've got talked about for the entire time. So there's the um, Arts Minds website, uh, which is artsminds.co.uk. Um, all of these links, of course, will be put onto the comments afterwards and it'll be a separate post which we'll put on the page and share that separately. Uh, if you're also a working practitioner in the theatre industry, there's the 24 hour theatre helpline uh, from theatrehelpline.org, which is 0800 915 4617. Um, there's also just the general charities that do help um, everyone. So there's um, scrolling. Uh, da -da -da, Mind, uh, there's Calm, which is a campaign against living miserably. Um, there's Anxiety UK, there's many places. Head over to the NHS website where there's a long list, uh, which we've already mentioned. Um, if, you, if you do need any additional information, feel free. Um, or if you want to request any extra help, please comment and we'll be able to see if we can find a resource available to you. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any comments or questions that have come in. I think I got a few questions earlier. Uh, yes. um, so one of the questions is, how can we work to reduce the stigma that surrounds mental health? Uh, does anyone want to? Yes, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Erin's um, already doing this. I think she's doing lots of talks and I'm sure she can tell you all about those. But I'm going around doing workshops, both for vocational schools and for dance companies and putting it out there on my Instagram account, which is at Counseling for Dancers. And there's so many wonderful remarks that have come back about support. It has to come both from the top of the dance industry and from the bottom. In other words, the artistic directors, the managers, etc., must be more open to it to understand what they're putting their performers through. 
the principals of schools as well. The schools that I've worked for are wonderful. They're so open-minded. It's great. But it needs to come from the bottom as well. It needs to be shouted out loud. Now, Lily Hodge and the Dancers Network are brilliant. They're pushing it through as well. So those, those are the sort of uh, things. Back to the um, support, um, equity in BAPAM, as I mentioned before, I've got that. Erin's uh, already mentioned um, industry mines. They do a reduced uh, fee. I do a reduced fee as well, counsellingfordancers.com. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, anyone else got anything to chip in on that? I. Um, that's very uh, important. <laughs> Would you like sorry. to go, Gloria? Gloria, you go. Okay, sorry. No. I think like <laughs> a very important thing is that like dance teachers, I'm talking about dance, but I think for every kind of performing art, I think we should as teachers, like it doesn't matter if you're teaching children like once a week for an hour or if you're training um, like professional uh, dancers, I think we should all be aware of this and we should try to learn, you know, the, to recognize the signs if one of a student needs help, you know, and you can do this by uh, joining talks, joining webinar, whatever you can join, reading books, like even reading books, but try to be aware of this situation and try to, you know, like sometimes I, I feel this with my students and I've always been feeling this ever since I started when I was 20, like students are seeing their teacher like, they're God, they're like, you know, the best person in the world, they trust their teacher and, you know, they seek help from the teacher and we need to be able to, you know, point them to the right direction if they need help. So I think everything starts from the bottom. So like the schools, like, well, and not because the schools are the bottom because I teach at those schools. So just because it's the, the very first step, like kids and, teenagers are doing in the performing arts world. So everything needs to be covered from that point. Otherwise it can be too late, you know, because uh, if as teachers we're just pushing students uh, in terms of becoming great as uh, dancers body-wise, but we're not taking care of their minds, that is, uh, you know, something important is missing. So I think that is a very important thing. Yeah, um, Erin's just, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, Erin, that um, just said on there about the um, the mental health first aid, uh, the mental health first aid courses, because I know this is becoming a bigger issue in modern society, and there is training on support in mental health, uh, they are available online, and also Tina added about, um, Samaritans are also a good helpline, um, Papyrus, and if you are feeling like you are in, in more of an urgent need of crisis, then you can call 111 or 999 if it is an emergency. So I just wanted to add that in there. Uh, Erin, do you want to go ahead? Sorry, did I jump over you, Nicolette? What's that for me, huh? Did you want to say something before I go, Nicolette? I, I, I did, but I'm, I'm not pushing. Go I'm ahead, not pushing. sorry we're gonna, about that. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, no, we're all gonna get a chance, there's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for, for acknowledging that. Um, I was going to say, I think also it's about legislation as well, is um, advocates in government, um, you know, finding ways to shout it from the rooftop so that it becomes something that's documented and is across the board for everybody, that mental health is the equivalent of physical health. The only thing is you can't see it. So it's, it's hidden. And that makes it a bit of a stigma um, because you only see the symptoms. So I think that um, from, the, from that perspective, legislation. Also, um, the Creative Genius, myself, the creativegenius.com is the website. Um, I'm doing webinars and going around to different creative industry institutions um, and also stepping into performing arts as well to support their emotional intelligence, um, mainly because unfortunately as children, we are not taught how to manage our emotions. And so as we step into adulthood, we become emotionally ignorant instead of emotionally intelligent. And we don't appreciate, if we can't manage our own emotions, how can we recognize someone else's emotional issues that are going on? So we become desensitized. So uh, you know, I'd like to contribute towards that side of assisting people to realize that if we can manage what's going on inside as a manifestation 
then we can support ourselves and support other people as well. So top down and then you know, talking, as was said, getting out there and just spreading the word and not being ashamed of it. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. I think the, uh, I think Yardu just cut off at the, towards the end there. Um, don't know what happened. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> In my prime. <laughs> um, I think we still got everything. Um, so, Evan, is there anything you want to add on that? Just a tiny thing. Um, I guess it's just about um, addressing the stigma, and I think it's very important to find your voice. And I think. Um, in a traditional dance environment, there's a little opportunity for people to perhaps have a sense of what's called autonomy or a sort of voice in their environments and a sense of choice. Because often in dance environments, we have a very didactic environment where somebody is the knowledge holder and other people are supposed to be knowledge containers. So the dance teacher, for example, knows everything about that technique or that area of, of dance and they give it to the dancers and the dancers regurgitate it in that same way. Um, and actually what's very important both for mental health and for addressing stigma is to be able to talk about your needs and to give yourself a voice in a respectful way. So I think everyone is human and everyone has emotional challenges and everyone has challenges just full stop and us recognizing each other's challenges and being gentle with each other and gentle with ourselves but still being willing to say you know I don't I don't think that's the best thing for me right now or actually I have I have a question about that can we talk that through I'm sure that what you're trying to do is for the best and you think it's for the best but actually I'm not experiencing that way that that way so can we think of a different way to do that that's gonna come with a better outcome for everybody? I think that is a really important aspect in the dance world especially, because I think if, if no one knows what the issues are, then the stigma remains. And I think that's one of those things about what Nicolette was saying, you know, we're seeing a lot of symptoms, but we don't necessarily know where they're coming from because people are still afraid to say, this isn't the right thing for me, or this is hurting me, or, yeah, they're just not feeling able to speak up. And I think if we can find ways to speak up in, in community and in a way that is going to help us all to get better, rather than in a way that demonizes people, because I think that's a, a careful balance, right? I don't think that anyone ever wanted to hurt anyone else in the dance sector. I can't think of an artistic director, a teacher, or, you know, anyone else, a peer even that might be you know, saying stuff online that isn't particularly nice. I don't think that there's ever an intention to hurt people. I think there's an intention or a need internally to feel validated or um, a desire to help people to be performing at their best, which drives people to behave in ways that might not all, always be helpful. But until we can talk to each other in respectful ways and try and find solutions, solutions together, I think there will always be a stigma. So that's my piece. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got one minute remaining. Is there anything anyone like, would like to make their final messages? Um, so let's start with Nicolette. It, thanks, Josh. Um, I've had a, a, something that's been on my mind um, since part way through this, this is a, a calling to, 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 to clarify, is that coaches won't ever offer advice. Um, and I know that that's what we have been doing here. But just in that setting of with a client, we won't ever advise a client or tell them what to do. Instead, we offer a very safe, nourishing space um, with intention for the client, the person, to be able to explore and find what it is that they're looking for and what's causing blockages and ways that are stopping them. Um, and also literally about going from one place to the next. Yeah, so whatever it is you want to go towards, my, my role is to support you to get there gracefully with courage and with love all the way walking beside you. Um, just had a calling just to, to clarify that. No, no, that, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, Gloria? Um, yeah, no, I think uh, maybe one thing that I can add is related to this, but 
No, completely. I was talking to some colleagues, other dance teachers uh, over the last few days, and uh, we were talking about, you know, uh, using this time, this lockdown time that we have as teachers, because of course, even if we teach a lot of virtual classes, it's not really the same as before. Uh, so we were saying that as teachers, we can use this time to think about the way we usually teach our students. So, you know, like if you if you think that from uh, a specific class or a specific group of uh, students or any specific students, you can't really get what you want to get from from them. Uh, you can maybe use this time to think about another approach to teach you know what you were teaching them because this is going to affect your mental health as a teacher and their mental health as students and as future performers so i think you know this can be maybe an interesting thing to think about for other teachers that are listening to this panel uh, think about the way you deliver your information the way you teach remember that every single student is different and they probably need a different approach of course it's not always possible to you know like to do in a very different way for every single student that you have in class it's not like physically possible but you can think about other ways to deliver what you usually deliver in class and maybe at the end of the lockdown when you will start again uh it will be a new you know a new age for everyone and uh, maybe their mental health will be Effective for the better. Thank you very much. Terry. I think I want to follow up what Nicolette was saying, um, but from a different point of view. In Derek Dean's Swan Lake in the round at the Albert Hall, there are 40 swans. Now, looking at them, they all look identical. Of course, they're not. Each one has had a different childhood, a different upbringing. In my type of therapy, there isn't one size fits all. So each one is individual, each one is unique. I just wanted to say that. No, that's amazing. Thank you very much. And Erin? Just embrace that you're a human being and that it's okay to have challenges. And in fact, that challenges um, when supported and when you are able to experience challenges with help, those are often the things that help you to grow and to get better. So recognize that when you experience challenges, mental health challenges, physical health challenges, challenges in your career and your training, those can be an opportunity for growth. Um, but seek help to make them uh, those opportunities. And if you're feeling like you're struggling, definitely reach out for help. Thank you very much. Um, so there are a few questions we didn't get to today just because we ran out of time. I think we all have some other, I've got some other things to get on to. I think some other things to do that too. Um, would it be okay if I sent some more questions over to you if I could get a brief response through email and I'll try and get that written down and shared out uh, just to know we're all a bit time restrained and things are going on that we need to all sort out. Sure. Um, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of you for your responses today. Um, it's been great to be seeing others in the industry doing what we do. Um, I hope people who've been watching have enjoyed it. Um, I know there is a 20 second delay, so I hope it's hard to keep on top of those things. Um, there, there will be a recording of this. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and it will also be distributed out to all of the people on the panel here today. Um, so if you do feel like watching, it will be overall on YouTube and I'll try and keep a copy back here on Facebook. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, thank you very much, Josh. Okay. Uh,